Yeah. All right, cool. All right. Oh. I have to turn my volume down. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I guess we're on live. Can everybody hear us? And we're waiting on our guests too, aren't we? Yes. Okay. So, looks like we have three, four people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can everybody hear us? Oh, Melody says yes. Okay, okay. good, good, good. And welcome. I'm so glad you can join us. We don't get to do these very often. And we are. Ernest Roots said yes as well. Okay, all right. Hey, Ernest Roots. How are you guys? I, I'm guessing you know uh, Jeff from the APAPA uh, conference. Maybe more than that. You'll have to tell me. Okay, awesome. Yes, and, and thank both of you for sharing like you did. Oh, thank you, uh, Hector. Yeah, we're sharing on both Facebook and YouTube. So you'll hear us uh, refer to a comment that you might not see, and it might be on a different platform. Yeah. Um, like I said, we normally, for people that are watching this on the replay and watching now, uh, we normally do these lives um, at least the first Saturday of each month uh, at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, we're trying to get more guests on our lives to talk about uh, their experiences and um, good content that we can learn from. Yeah. Yeah. Cause we're kind of like in the baby steps of our journey. So it's really nice to have experience um, doing things that we're trying to do to learn from and also to help our audience out. Yeah. Cause um, we're trying to basically help everybody is, um, to learn exactly from what other people are doing. It doesn't mean you have to follow it step by step, but at least you'll have a different in, insight about. I think uh, it's you know. neat to know that there's more than one way. Like there's mm -hmm. a ton of different ways to do the same stuff and a bunch of them work. But I do like what um, Jeff is on the same path that we are on as well yeah waiting for him to connect i think he might be having some is he having a connection issue yeah okay we are still waiting on our guest that was our main content for this evening because he has great information mm -hmm. and he was a speaker right yeah he was a speaker uh for those that are on right now and <laughs> watch it on the replay our is anyone doing any pasture poultry like chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys, any of that? Hey, Sonny. Oh, yay. Emma's here. Hey, Emma. Uh, ch -ch 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 Melody. Oh. oh, thanks for sharing, Melody. This oh. is your first live check. Well, welcome. I'm glad this. You know, you. and Ernest Roots, you guys do a lot of things. So I think it would be cool for you guys to do a live chat sometime to talk about the stuff that you guys are doing there. And uh, Emma, you're not just doing chickens. You're doing uh, ducks too, aren't you? Uh, I'm sorry if I don't say your name, but Fabre. Fabre Hector. My, my husband and I are looking for land to start a little chicken farm. Okay. Well, this is perfect timing for you. Sid and I, uh, before we bought our property, we spent over a year um, going to conferences, talking to people with experience, and just basically doing a lot of homework because um, we weren't raised this way. And we really liked the idea of having everything work together like naturally or as naturally and organically as possible. Um, so we're very drawn to this regenerative agriculture methods and um, sustainable stuff. So like this is the perfect time if you haven't gotten your property yet 
to at least be inspired by some information um, to kind of help you figure out how you want to do things. So Emma said that they do chicken and ducks for eggs and chicken for meat. So how has everybody um, Saturday been so far? Uh, what all have y'all done? We just had a viewer um, come and was asking for some guidance on how to start seed. So a we city girl. Yeah, yeah. So we spent a, a almost the whole morning uh, showing her how to um, how to start seeds, and we even gave her uh, gifted her a bootstrap farmer tray and some uh, cell packs. So that way she can uh, nurture and baby her seeds. We did some tomatoes, peppers, some okra, and she's planning to do uh, like a garden. Is it at her parents' um, her parents' place? And um, I think we kind of convinced her that she could have a garden on her patio mm -hmm. at her apartment because um, he did that at the apartment for his job. Uh, before we came to buy this place, as well as the raised beds that we had in our urban backyard. Cool. Fab. Okay, good. I'll just say fab then, yeah. Oh, cool. Yes, uh, fab said, I don't think we are strong enough to do meat. <laughs> we are. He enough. didn't think so either. I'll just tell you that. Yeah, I, I, before this whole lifestyle, I didn't do... I was not into blood or in, not, I'm not saying that I still am, but I didn't do the whole blood thing and, and everything, but you know, being this lifestyle, you got to kind of. It, it's it. like a rabbit hole. As soon as you <laughs> start like sustainably doing stuff and then you learn. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, Hey, Odie. She is so silly. I know. I love her. Um, but as soon as She's you start doing this, I love her dog. <laughs> she needs to give me her dog. <laughs> Nothing. Hand, hand pink waving, hand pink waving. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> hey, guys. Oh, it show it differently. Oh, okay. oh. Let's show it differently. Okay. Uh oh. There we go. Sweet. So, um, so Emma said, don't underestimate your abilities. I'm from SoCal too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's going on, J3? Oh, it's been a minute, J3, G3. Kip in North Alabama. All right. That's what's up. So Melanie said, same here. Started a garden four years ago. Then got backyard chickens. Done any of it before. Uh, I was raised in a city like us, uh, but here I am still learning and growing just like us. And that's well. really what it is. All of this has been a journey. Um, we're doing things we never thought we would do. Like, I, I can just tell you that. We thought um, we're just going to have a garden and being foodies, uh, we never thought that we were going to have all these birds, did we? Uh -uh. Or hatching them or now shipping them. Um, so don't don't decide just yet what you're not going to do. Uh, it's crazy. Never say never. Yeah, it's crazy how life uh, kind of changes a little bit. Um, especially as you want to become more sustainable or, or more educated about, you know, the life that you can give an animal so it only has one bad day versus um, this stuff in stores these days. So I think that motivated us. Uh -huh. Yeah. To just kind of know where our food comes from. But we uh, are not completely there. Um, we still need... Um, to get stuff at the store. I, I don't see us ever being able to be like 100% off that. But it's nice to take the pressure off and have have some ourselves. Oh, Ernest Root said, never sheep. We got sheep. That's what we want. We want sheep. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm really wanting sheep. We're waiting for Jeff. I'm not sure where 
he is at. I sent him another invite and just to make sure he got checked the link. on Instagram to see. I'm not sure where he's at. Yeah, he's he's um, supposed to be here with us. He has a, some great content for people that are in the poultry industry, regenerative uh, poultry industry that would like uh, to earn uh, income, how you can earn income off of uh, one acre or more or less. Yeah, that's one thing I really like about his content because, um, and I find myself saying this, I find myself saying we only have six and a half acres. Um, and other people, I'll catch them saying, I only have two acres. It's incredible what you can do with one acre. Like there is so much you can do with one acre. And I have to remind myself when I say, oh, I only have six and a half, because to me, I'm thinking I can't have cow, you know, I can't have cows or certain things I can't do. But there's a lot you can do just with an acre. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so I said plant some seeds today planted my potatoes in five gallon buckets i sure hope we tried the whole we did our potatoes one year in um the fabric uh container and it was we got, okay yeah we had a small harvest it was okay we actually did better on our sweet potato harvest in those bags but it was in a larger bag than that but i'm thinking about because we have a lot of mennonites in this community uh possibly uh, doing raisins, not raisin, growing some potatoes. Raisin, raised beds. <laughs> no, growing some potatoes uh, and more carrots. Be- oh, excuse me, because we're going to be having a lot of stew birds, uh, birds that were retiring, going into freezer camp. And that would be very beneficial for them to use in potatoes, carrots, and celery. And, and for me, that's chicken tortilla soup. Yeah. <laughs> Emma knows I'm, about that. I, I, I have chicken tortilla soup. Uh, in the other room, cooling off right now. Yeah. Uh, Fab said, do you sell any of your animals alive? Uh, yes, actually we do. Um, we just had... We don't ship them. Yeah. We, I will tell you that. We haven't shipped them. Uh, we don't feel comfortable just yet, but uh, we will be... Ha- we Our rabbits just had some babies. They're so cute. Oh and, my gosh. And, um, and we got, what, 20, 21 of them? Uh, eight, 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 yeah, we've five, got 21 yeah. uh, baby rabbits. Uh, we're after about four to six weeks, we're going to be weaning them off from their mothers and be selling those, selling trios. We all three does had some, uh, had a litter, and we have a bunch of chicks. You're going to hear a lot of peeping sounds. Oh, yeah, cheep, cheep, cheeps. If you haven't already, uh, we just had four geese. Well. Uh, more than that. We had six geese. Yeah, six geese. Six geese. Um, I just gave one to my neighbor. It's in our Instagram story. So if you haven't seen that, you need to go check out our Instagram story because um, it just warms my heart uh, to see the excitement of a neighbor kid um, get a, a gift from us that I'll get to watch them take care of. Um, so that was really cool today. <laughs> And um, we have some baby ducks, some Welsh harlequin ducks. And we had a uh oh Swedish duck <laughs> in the mix that I'm going to give as a bonus to somebody that buys some of our Welsh harlequins. And then we have what, 50 uh, something American breast chicks? Yes. Yeah, we have American breast chicks. Um, our first batch, the last of those just left. Somebody has secured 13 of these, right? Mm-hmm. And then we're, we just have to find people that are looking for American brands. Yeah, we, we had um, a large people, a large amount of people were interested. And then we, I did the MailChimp so that way it could just send it all mass instead of trying to find out each email that who needs to uh, send out the email to. But nobody responded. Some opened it, but I guess they, um something happened but yeah so i decided i'm not hatching out anymore um right now it's just it's easier for us to now i mean we know that they're fertile eggs because obviously we have a ton of them um we're just shipping them and i've actually shipped quite a few to some people yeah uh, already that have them already have them in their incubators and uh so that's gone really well 
the uh, for those that are watching right now and um, watching on the replay, what is your idea? What would you like to get out of uh, raising your chickens, bird, uh, chickens, duck, geese, turkeys, whatever that you're wanting to raise? And that's a good question because I don't think we had it all figured out. Like we kept finding different things um, as we had them. And we had an idea, like when we got our animals, when we started with chickens and turkeys, we had like these preconceived notions that have evolved with experience. Like everything has changed and involved, evolved with like actually having hands on them, boots on the ground, dealing with them. Yeah. Ernest said, uh, we, we intensely rotate milk cows on two acres. How many milk cows are y'all rotating on two acres? It's doable, and the milk provides so much, so many uses. See, it's just us two. Yeah, so if I had, um, like, a, a litter of children here, yeah. I would, and I don't know if you guys do or not, um, but it's just the two of us, and he's lactose intolerant. So Can we tell my business like that? Oh, no, I'm going to be telling your business <laughs> like that. Um, so it's, it's like not motivating to us. Um, yes. Chicken tortilla soup is the business. It's my uh, favorite. We, we are raising Tamuk rabbits. They're uh, geared for the Texas A&M of Kins, Kinsville. Uh, they're geared for the Texas heat. Uh, or any heat, like any place that has lots of heat. Yeah. But yeah. mostly for Texas. And, uh, we've never lost so far. Uh, rabbit uh, due to that extreme yeah, heat Yeah, it's 115 year. degrees here, and we did not lose a rabbit, and they are outside. We do have them in a shaded area. We did around 1 to 2 o'clock every day. I would take a frozen water gallon uh, jug out of the freezer and put it in with them, and that kept them, <laughs> you know, yes, uh, cool enough. We do have a lot of animals. <laughs> But I, I, I think I waited for it to be like 100 degrees until I gave them like the frozen gallons. Like mm -hmm. if it was under that, they didn't need it. Just one cow? And you're milking a cow? Just one cow? What'd you do with the, the calf? Uh, I'm actually from Fort Hood, Colleen, Texas. Um, I'm there. He was born there. <laughs> yeah. They're, and if you didn't know, they're changing the name of Fort Hood to some other name now what? uh but yep i'm born in darnell hospital my two kids were born in darnell my two hospital. kids were born at darnell uh, yeah. hospital and you're the the misfit That's i'm it. i'm from galveston <laughs> i'm cooler than fort hood sorry Ooh, nobody's cooler than fort hood <laughs> <laughs> anybody that knows better know <laughs> that's not cool <laughs> yes no chemical eggs and chicken mm -hmm. oh there we go jeff here we go. There uh, we go, Jeff. Do we? <laughs> what, what was it? Technical or time zone? <laughs> uh, sorry, I got my uh, yeah, I got my times mixed up here. I thought it was eight thirty. I had my time off a little bit, but oh, um, okay. I was I was wondering if if we yeah. have a time zone. I I should have touched base with you. That's okay. Uh, that's my yeah. fault. Some somebody uh, was asking about you. Uh, yeah, are you looking back in the Yeah, looking at comments? the Okay. They said they I guess they talked to you a while back. Uh we know uh Ernest Roots uh that was at the Apple, they was there. Uh they probably was at one of your conference uh, your talks that was there. Mm-hmm. Uh where was it at? Oh, was there a specific question? Oh, Linda Chamberlain. I guess uh, she said, "Hey Jeff, it's been a long time since we last talked." Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hey, how's it going? Yeah. Good. So. Uh -oh. oh, you're fine. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh Ernest said that I guess y'all met in Texas. Like, was that um, uh, from the Apple convention? Yeah. Right yeah, definitely the Apple. Okay. Ernest Roots, good to see you. Okay, so uh, now that you're here, you yeah, yeah, sorry, a little late, but <laughs> no, that's okay. Yeah, so uh, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. um, how long have you how, how do you pronounce your last name, by the way? Uh, so wiki, so wiki, okay. Yeah. And what, what origin from is that? 
Uh, it's Polish originally, but I'm oh. definitely 100% American. <laughs> <laughs> I say that, well, I say that because my my wife's from Europe originally, and um, you know, and I, you know, when we met, started talking and you know, dating and everything, I would tell her, hey, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm Polish. She's like, you're not Polish, you're American. I'm like, yeah, I guess you're right. You know? <laughs> <She's> like, <laughs> I was like, well, my ancestors were Polish, you know. So I <laughs> You know, but uh, that's cute. So, uh, tell uh, everybody a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I've got a, a small farm here in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, we primarily raise pastured poultry, um, and uh, my focus really is on raising pastured poultry regeneratively. So you know, a lot of what we do is really trying to um, uh, kind of push the envelope, you know, see how we can minimize our impact, minimize our cost, and and, and also try to be successful, you know, doing what we're doing um, on, on small acreage. Um, and um, it wasn't easy to get started. Um, it was kind of a long journey, but um, but now we've, I feel like we really kind of hit our stride. And, 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 um, and now part of what I'm doing is just trying to help others and teach others how they can start, how you can be successful. You can have a profitable farm. You don't need a ton of acreage. You don't need a ton of money. Uh, it can be done. Um, and yeah, just trying to share some of the things that I've learned along the way. And how long have you been doing this now? So this will be year seven. Okay. Um, yeah. We're babies. <laughs> like we're in year two and lots yeah. of mistakes. So <laughs> how many acres are you on? Cause I mean, you reference small acreage and yeah. I, before you joined us, I was talking about, you know, I always say I only have six and a half in my mind, that's small, but two acres is large, you know? So I'm curious when you say small, what do you mean for you? Yeah. I mean, I started with just like an acre or two in the backyard, raising some meat chickens. Um, and, um, you know, went well, I loved the whole process, you know, it tasted so much better and gave some to friends and family. They loved it. And then seeing the impact it had on the land, I was like, oh, this is awesome. You know, it's better for the animal, better for the environment, the land, you know, the consumer. It's a win-win. So uh, we quickly grew. And so now we're farming on approximately five, sometimes six, seven acres. So, so not a lot. You know, we're definitely under 10 acres. Uh, we have some land that we lease occasionally from a neighbor. But, yeah, we're, we're under 10 acres um and you can the good nice thing about pasture poultry specifically if you're doing meat birds is you can raise a lot of birds you know four to five hundred birds per acre um so unlike cattle right if you're doing grass-fed beef it, you could raise one cow on one acre that would be 12 to 18 months and out of that cow you'd probably have maybe 800 pounds of sellable meat but if you raise poultry uh, you raise four to 500 birds per acre. Now I get about 2000 pounds of sellable meat, you know, two and a half times more meat in eight weeks, you know, versus 18 months, you know, so yeah. it's extremely yeah. efficient from a time standpoint and a land usage standpoint, the amount of protein you can grow. And so that's why I really honed in on the poultry because I had, you know, small acres just working with a couple acres getting started. And, um, and so, you know, it, it's very doable to do it without having a huge farm. Yeah, with our size, we're considering sheep is what, you know, with what we're working with, aside from poultry yeah. that we're doing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have uh, Fab. They were wanting to know uh, what's the best breed of chicken for someone that starts with zero, that knows zero about taking care of them. I, I, for yeah. me, if I, I'll, I'll answer that. Priorities. I, I think it all depends on where you're located. Uh, you want to make sure you get the chicken that best suited for your area. Uh, like if you're in Michigan or up north, you don't want to get a chicken that's not that able to handle the cold, especially with the large combs and and waddles and all of that. What What do you suggest? Yeah, I would agree. Um, you know, if you're if you're doing it on a homesteading level or you know, per, for personal use, you know, um, yeah, hundred percent. There's there's so many breeds you can choose from. They all have their own unique characteristics, right? Um, if you are looking to do this more as a commercial scale type thing, um, I usually tell folks to start with the the typical the the standard industrial breeds. Um, in fact, I even have a resource if 
folks are interested, they can go to a website and I have a little re- comparison chart of the top uh, uh, chicken and duck breeds th- to use for both meat and eggs. Mm-hmm. And um, put that link in there. Yeah, the link is regenerative success.com backslash breeds. Um, and it's just a little chart, it has a little write up, talks about the different breeds you can use for meat, whether you're doing meat production or, um, or egg production. Um, and, and, and this is, you know, more geared if you want to do it commercial scale, if you're really trying to make money doing this, and then you, I tell folks it's best to start with the best, the breed that's going to perform the best. If you want to do meat, raise a meat bird. If you want to do eggs, raise an egg, a high producing egg layer, because farming is so hard. The margins are already so thin, you know, you know, there's a lot of these dual purpose and these other breeds that are fantastic, you know, on a smaller scale, but, but if it's already so difficult, don't make it hard on yourself by limiting your egg production, right? By getting a bird that only lays 150 eggs when you could have a bird that lays 280 eggs, right? You're already, you're running uphill already, you know? Yeah. Um, for ex- So, you know, that, that's, that's what I say. And then, you know, after you get experience, after things start going well, you get more familiar with it, get, you know, more, um, I know you guys do the breast chickens. I think that's awesome. That's something I've been wanting to try. Um, but you know, after you get more experience, then you can say, okay, now I can start experimenting with some of these other breeds. If I know there's yeah. a market for it, if I know there's certain characteristics I really like about this breed, then yeah, go for it. But I would say starting out, um, you know, start with the breeds that are kind of proven. Um, yeah. And then you, uh, you also, uh, I forgot to mention on, on the answer to the question, you know, are you wanting meat birds? Are you want egg layers? Are you wanting the hybrid? Uh, those all hybrid, but dual purpose uh, bird as well. So, and some people just want like heritage breeds, you know. It, it, yeah. So that all plays a major part. But I didn't understand any of that. Um, no, when we first got I, into I only this. learned about blooms about two years ago. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now you you also do more than just chickens you also do uh ducks uh do you and you got a, a mean goose i i, 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 yeah. Yeah. I have a mean goose yeah we got a mean goose which is good because that's his job he's supposed yeah. to be yeah. you gotta be a wily goose so he does his job yeah uh, we don't want any nice geese the nice geese get called you know because <laughs> they're, they're our guard geese dude. they're protecting the flock so we want yeah. to be mean but um yeah yeah we do we so we raise uh chickens we do uh, a lot of duck production so we raise meat ducks um and then we also do turkeys um and a few geese geese are just kind of more of a side thing um yeah i'm still deciding whether i want to keep them or not and i've had them for about three years now <laughs> so i'm like <laughs> i should make a decision soon but I, <laughs> you know the thought was to do them for either maybe a meat production or egg production bird but still on the fence about that <laughs> um but uh but yeah so we do a couple of different things here and what kind of ducks do you raise uh we do the jumbo pecans um so they're a large fast growing meat bird you know the white ducks that you see like on the aflac commercials um and they've been great. Um, we, you know, starting out early in the beginning, um, when I decided I want to actually make this as a farm business, um, there's a lot of people raising chickens in the area. And I didn't want to be just another pasture raised chicken farmer. Um, I mean, it would have been fine. I'm sure there's plenty of customers to go around, but um, no one was raising ducks. Uh, I had tried them. Uh, we are very flat. We're in a coastal area and we get a lot of rain. And so, you know, chickens don't like to be wet. Uh, ducks are super happy the more standing water we have out in the field. So yes. it makes Our sense. field is saturated right now, yeah. and it's like it's the ducks and the geese paradise yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> they love it. Yeah, and I was like, this just makes sense. You know, let's do some ducks, and and um, got in with a few restaurants. Um, started with a couple restaurants, and that really took off. You know, it's like one chef knows a few other chefs, and people start hearing about you and what you're doing, and. And yeah, that kind of took off the whole restaurant thing. And so we've worked with over 50 chefs and restaurants over the years. Um, and that was kind of our bread and butter. I was doing just a lot of restaurant sales. They really liked the duck, the pasture raised ducks. Um, but when COVID hit, it was like uh, all the restaurants shut down, right? Yeah. Wow. Know how to eat. All, all the restaurants didn't know how to adjust shut down. Yeah. Yeah. And uh you know, that was my bread and butter. I was like 95% of my sales were direct to restaurants. And I was like, Holy moly. Things are full yeah. of 
that ducks. Was awesome. And I was like, now what? Um, so we shifted and started doing the farmer's market, started selling direct to consumer, which is something I always wanted to do, but it was kind of on the back burner. And um, that took off and, and we really kind of dialed that in. And now we've pretty much flipped and we're doing about 95% uh, direct to consumer and just maybe 5% wholesale at this point. Okay. Yeah, that, that was my next question after I uh, go on to here uh, is, so with the dealing with restaurants, you basically had to do a lot of wholesale and, and, and I guess your profit wasn't uh, as, as much as you will ret uh, retail. And how often did you have to sell to those uh, rest restaurants? And did you process it your own self or did you have to send it off to a butcher? Yeah. Um, yeah. So to answer the processing question, we started out doing our own processing and I quickly found out that I did not want to process ducks myself anymore. <laughs> I was like, forget <laughs> this. Um, it, was just, it is, yeah, it is not, not a good time. Uh, it's just so hard to get them clean. You got the timing right to get all those feathers off, all the pen feathers. I mean, it is just, it's a lot of hard work. I think it was like me and the first time it was like me and eight people um and we were trying wax we're doing all these different things that we had heard read about and it was our first time but it took us Sounds i like think we were working for about 12 hours straight and to do like 79 ducks and it was like oh my yeah. god this is crazy. that's insane and we're i just frustrated out. with the four that i did <laughs> yeah. yeah and so we quickly and as we grew and started raising more and more larger batches i was like yeah there's no way i can do this so yeah we take them to a usda processor um, was it more to find one um, near you guys? What's that? that was it was it hard to find? Because I'm running into finding butchers uh, that it, deals with chicken the way that and, we want, and, and the the different poultry yeah. is the yeah. I'm how right hard, hard how hard is it in your area? Yeah, they're few and far between. Um, you know, each state on average has about one or two. USDA processors that do poultry that will work with small to mid-sized farmers. So um, that's so another challenge. Like when you find it, how far mm -hmm. it is from you and then loading animals up and getting, that's a whole other part of it, yeah. right? That's challenging. Yeah, hundred percent. It, it is. Um, and, and our processor, um, I found the one that was about two hours away from me did a great job with chickens and turkeys. I've been bringing them to him for some time. And then when I started bringing ducks, it's just a completely different animal. You know, it's a waterproof chicken. It's got three times the amount of feathers on it. And so um, they were just really struggling with it, you know, struggling to get a nice, clean product that didn't have a lot of feather on it. And so eventually um, I started looking around. I was like, where else can I go? Because they're just not doing a good job. And it's just, you know, it's got to be a quality product. I was like, I'll pay more, but it's got to look good. It's got to be presentable. And um, and so I found the closest one I could find uh, – uh, processor that would do ducks and would did them well was in kentucky which for, from where i was about a 12-hour drive oh um, so I load up ducks um and i would fill up a trailer i'd take about 400 at a time and drive 12 hours all through the night to get there at 6 a.m uh in kentucky they would process all day i would spend the night and then pick up the finished product the next day and drive 12 hours home oh uh, so, See, that's what i'm afraid of <laughs> yeah and so we did that for a couple of years. Um, and yeah, I mean, you, you gotta do what you gotta do. You know, it was kind of where it was the only option or, or do it myself. And I just didn't have the equipment or the manpower to do, you know, large volumes of ducks, um, uh, efficiently. Um, so. Oh, Odie, uh, what you say, what months are the most challenging? How do you prepare for that? Uh, can you explain just a little bit more now? Um, for for the what did you have main equipment for uh, plucking for uh processing your animals what equipment did i use yeah uh yeah i mean i bought i bought a nice uh picker it was like the featherman brand okay. um picker um and uh i built a scalder so just off the plane, makes such a big difference. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
The scalding's huge. I mean, it's it's just as important, probably more important than the picker. If you don't get yeah. it, in the yeah, it's a, it's a showstopper. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. we we recently got the uh, electric automatic scalder, and yeah. that is changed everything. Yeah, because <laughs> we don't have to go now to go get propane. We don't have yeah. to check the temperature to make sure it's not too hot, not too cold. Make sure the flame didn't go out and stuff. Right. I mean, just doing that alone kills, you know, about every five minutes of checking that. And then if it yeah. gets too hot, you got to wait till it cools down. You got to em- either empty out some of the water, put some more water in there, then get it was just frustrating. Yeah. But I mean, it's a good time for us to talk to you because um, we're actually about to go through our first time of picking up this this week. I'm getting 110 chicks and we're going to be growing them out on the pasture and we're about to have our first time trying to figure out how to get them all the way to the processor and, and we already have a date like i already scheduled the the processing date ahead of time because they said it was best to do that you know yeah because they they come up real quick yeah, yeah so, <laughs> yeah. that's how new we are we're about to have our first time going to an actual usda nice. processor <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So she was saying about the weather. The weather, you can't. That's the one thing I don't like about the Cornish cross because they're so fat. They're bred to be, breed faster than you even get their feathers. Mm-hmm. And so you can't really have a high perch for them in your coop uh, because they can't fly up there. That's why I love the American breast. Even though they're a heritage breed, they're not as big. And it takes a little bit longer when you're growing heritage breeds, especially dual purpose. It takes a while for them to get to a, a ideal weight, but you don't have to worry about any of the troubles, especially even during the heat with the, the American breed. But I mean, they're not really for like a mass production thing. It's no. really for like us. Foodies. We're foodies. So we like yeah. having really, you know, it's really personal for us to have them for us. And then the ones that we sell are to other people that want to be just, you know, self-sufficient on their homestead. Yeah. But we're actually, we are getting like Cornish cross for when we get our cuts for customers and that's what we're. And for classes, yeah. we're teaching other people how to process their own chickens and yes. things like that. And it's easier to teach them on a Cornish cross. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I agree with the weather. Like, yeah, if, if, if it's, yeah, the corners don't do well in heat. Ducks don't do well in heat. We usually take two to three months off in the summertime uh, raising birds because it's just so hot, humid where I am. I don't get snow or, or very rarely we, do we ever get snow or freezing weather. So we'll produce through the winter time and then take the summer months off. If you're in a northern climate, you'll probably produce through the spring, summer, and fall and then take the winter months off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Emma was like, "Yeah, I want an electric scalder so bad. It's a game changer." I mean, yeah. you, and you, got the automatic you got the automatic rotary. You got the automatic rotary on yours. No, we don't have that on our scalder because we got okay. the um, what's the brand? Stromberg. We got Stromberg. the Stromberg one. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, but after seeing that one at Featherman, I was like, "Man, that was." Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about the the. Yeah, I'm usually on kill station, so I would like, yeah. Yeah, so, so that I've been able to raise corn across through the summer here, but it's crucial for them to be outside of the tractor in open space. Yeah, so now Emma, she is in Missouri, and she kind of allows them to be a free range. She has them go in in the coop at in the evening, but allows well, them. Well, she go has out. them in netting. Yeah, she yeah. has them in, uh, in electric netting, or at least netting. And allows them to go outside their coop and uh, forage and, and and a little bit and stuff like that. So, and they won't go very far from their food anyway. Yeah. They just get to where, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. So how how hard was it to get into um, into the restaurant business, uh, selling it selling it to them? Did it take a, a lot of uh, no's to get to that one yes? No, um, I got lucky. Like the first yes um, was like the first chef I approached. I got a lot of no's after that, but (laughs) (laughs) Uh, because he was like, I didn't know him, but he was a local restaurant. You know, small family owned restaurant. You had a really great reputation. They're always booked up. And I just 
I, I think I just, I can't remember if I emailed him first or called him or, or whatever. But anyway, I, I talked to him and he's like, yeah, I live right down the road. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, I live real close to you, like a couple miles from you. He's like, I love to come see the farm. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And so he came out here and I walked around, showed him what I was doing, talked about what I was doing. And, and he loved it and gave him a sample. And, um, and then he bought like, He's like, I was like, what do you think? And he was like, yeah, I'll take two dozen. And I was like, what? You know, and I was like blown away. Like two dozen birds is not like a game changer by any means. But for me, I was like, that was my first like wholesale deal, restaurant body. And it was just the fact that he believed in me and like wanted to buy my product. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, like it just gave me hope and like a lot of confidence that people actually appreciated this. And um, it just gave me that drive to keep going. Uh, after that, I got a lot of no's though. <laughs> I've been to a lot of restaurants. But that one uh, yes makes you feel like you're on top of the world. I mean, even we we yeah. never got that many, but even when somebody purchased one chicken, I'm like, for real? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, when I was listening to you say that, it made me want to ask, like, what brought you to this? What made you want to do this? Yeah. Um, you know, I I, I never. <laughs> I've always been an outdoorsman, so I've enjoyed um, getting, a, you know, hunting, fishing, growing our own food and that kind of thing, which that's always been something I've enjoyed. But I never really set out to be a farmer. Um, I never thought I'd be a poultry farmer. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I think it was it was the fact that, you know, when I raised these birds and I gave them to friends and family, they said it was fantastic. Not only was it was the food better flavor more nutritious you know healthier for us uh the, the animals were raised in a much better environment you know eating grass and bugs getting fresh air um and then i saw the impact on the land and saw how they you know eat the grass and then it regrows and they're sequestering soil we've done soil tests and and uh and every year we increase our soil organic matter by one percent just by rotating poultry in our pastures and that's incredible because the more organic matter you have, the more water your soil can hold, the more nutrients your soil can hold, the better your 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 plants, your crops, your trees will grow if you do decide to plant it. Um, and, and that's also a lot of carbon that's getting sequestered in the soil. Um, so that was really cool to see that and see the results, you know, physically see it. And, and um, it was like, man, this is like a win, win, win. You know, it just totally makes sense to raise our food this way. Um, and then I could see where it also could potentially be, you know, a solution, you know, a, 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 a solution to help the environment and to help with climate change and this kind of thing. And, and I was like, just super excited about that and just got hooked on, you know, bought every book I could find on regenerative agriculture, watched every video and stuff and just got hooked on it. And, and um, yeah, it's really been a, a fun journey. And I like experimenting. Uh, that's been a big fun part for me, you know, like always trying different shelter design, or like, let's see how much I can like reduce their feed consumption by substituting other grains and other things and, and doing things like that. And that's, that kind of gets me excited is like trying new things and experimenting and, and seeing, you know, I think this regenerative agriculture movement and particularly pastured poultry has come a long way from the conventional model of raising poultry and, and tight cramped barns where they're sitting on concrete and in their own filth and manure and not getting fresh air or sunlight. So it's a huge step. I mean, it's a thousand percent better but um but i feel like there's still a, a long way we could go uh in particular like i have to get a lot of inputs on my farm i have to buy a lot of feed that's grown in a not so regenerative manner on another farm somewhere that's probably yeah. deep in the soil and, and my soil is getting richer and, and more nutrition and you know more soil life and better so um so i feel like there's a lot of a long way we can still go with this and and that's what's exciting for me is just kind of experimenting trying new things and seeing how far we can push the envelope of regenerative agriculture when you mentioned um about the soil like that really has been a driving force for him um, soil life. yeah <laughs> yeah everything every decision that's made actually is with the soil with us because we came over on this side of things as gardeners uh hence the name <laughs> the naked gardeners but I, I was curious when you said um of, about testing your soil are you particular on a schedule of a certain time of year that you always test and test certain areas and how, how do, you, do you test it yeah how do you go about that yeah our, our um agriculture extension office they do soil testing and it's, i think it's like seven dollars a sample it's super cheap okay. and and they give you instructions and you just basically just take a small bag you take a small sample and they tell you how to take it um how deep to take the soil sample 
and and so we'll sample from a couple of different areas on the pasture just to make sure we got you know a good representation because you know it can be changed it can change you know different areas um and i don't do it at any particular time of year it's just whenever i think about it um <laughs> okay really, <laughs> um but yeah it's pretty incredible normal a normal soil test they don't give you organic matter percent that's something i ask for extra oh um, okay because that's really extra something that's important to me Okay. She yeah. said, "Do you have to pay extra for that?" Uh, I can't remember. It might have been like a dollar extra. I can't remember. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That, that's good to know that you have to. That's something you can ask for. Now, do they break it down by your pH level, your MPK, yeah. your other micro and, and uh, micro macro exactly. and micro nutrients? Yeah, especially your macro, your micro MPK and pH is primarily what you get on a standard soil test. And then okay. you can ask for like organic matter or certain other things if you want them in addition. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ernest Roof said they got the uh, the entire featherman system. Y'all must be banking. <laughs> they do a hundred birds pretty much all till dark. Now they can do two hundred and be done by supper. Nice. Yeah. Game changer. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually just the two. Yeah. Of how us. many? How yeah. many of them have? It? <laughs> uh, we got the large uh, scalder from Strongbird. Yeah, the th I think it was the 31. Now, I will say this before you get that, it comes with a core. It doesn't come with the plug, and you have to have a two. It plugs into a 220 uh, oh. outlet. Yeah. So you got to go to the big box store, get your plug, and do all that. And the cord is only like six foot long. So it that's yeah. the only thing I really don't like about their their core i wish i could make it longer and i probably could, we could. We can. but i'm not an electrician nor play one on tv so i don't, I don't like to play mm -hmm. with electrical and water you know <laughs> last thing i need to do is dunk a that's one of his big fears <laughs> <And> you, ah! <laughs> <laughs> so if it's electrical i'm usually the one <laughs> yeah. <doing> it. Yeah. <laughs> uh emma said the missouri extension also requires you requires you to ask for organic matter too. Oh, okay. okay so you have yeah. to if you don't know that you i mean it's good to talk about yeah because with us we use redmond's uh soil sample now they don't tell the whole organic uh, matter portion of it but they will tell you the whole mpk uh your macro uh and mac macro and micro and um things of that nature and they'll send it to you electronically so you'll have your li library yeah. file of it as each year goes. I'm actually gonna do one tomorrow on that. Yeah. Nice. So cool. Now uh you now you do a um I guess a um a class or a program to get people uh into poultry farming. We want to kind of tell people about that and how they can get uh, get involved with that. Sure. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, I guess after shortly after we started doing this and, and you know, had a lot of people interested in this and asking me, you know, how, how can you be, you know, su successful with pasture poultry and, and do it on small acreage? And, and I learned everything the hard way, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of information out there, so to speak, you know, and I was just kind of figuring a lot of things out and it, and it cost me a lot of time, a lot of heartache, a lot of money. You know, I would, you know, I had like, you know, $60,000 on my credit card, you know, trying things that didn't work and doing too much and doing the wrong things. And, and then, you know, and then it was, you know, and then it was, how do you find customers and how do you make this profitable and, and all this stuff that I just had to figure out, you know, and, and I want to quit many times. Uh, it was hard. I can, I can hear the frustration. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it was uh, many times I was working a full-time job and trying to do the farm in my spare time and, and had a little kid on the way and, it was rough you know, for about three or four years, um, but I stuck with it because I'm just, I don't know, maybe stupid or refusing to give up. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I just wanted to make a program that could really help other people get started and avoid all these mistakes and avoid going into debt, doing all these things. Because once I learned how to do this properly, it was like, okay, you don't have to spend a ton of money. And so a lot of what I focus on, I, I built a program that teaches folks how to start up and scale a pastured poultry, a six figure pastured poultry farm without taking on debt. Uh, so a lot of it is focused on how to build out your own infrastructure, a lot of DIY tutorials uh, that, that are, you know, very inexpensive that you can build uh, to scale up your farm. 
Um, and then the other half of the program is teaching you, okay, now we've, we've established our infrastructure. We're raising animals. How do we find them? How do we, or how do we find customers? How do we actually market it? How do we sell it? How do we actually turn a profit on this thing? Um, and so the other part of it is, you know, how to market and sell and, and increase your profit margin and that sort of thing, uh, which I find is probably the biggest challenge of most farmers that I talk to because, you know, we, we want to farm, we want to be outside, we want to work with animals. A lot of times the marketing and sales is kind of an afterthought. I didn't know anything about marketing and sales. <laughs> I didn't know anything about how to sell food or do anything like that. And I just had to figure it out. And, um, you know, I find that more people I talk to that's, that can really be a, a, a struggle. Um, and, but I feel like we've really, uh, you know, we, we've, I've gained a lot of, you know, experience, you know, working with chefs as well as, you know, selling direct to consumer, you know, at farmer's markets and things of that nature. Um, and so it's, it's been pretty good, but, um, yeah. So if you want to check that out and go to regenerative success.com backslash training, I have, you know, a couple different online courses also do one-on-one -on -one coaching with more advanced farmers. Um, so yeah, there's a couple options there. Now, how long is this training? Is it self-paced or do you have like a module or anything of that nature? Yeah. So it's an online course and it's, um, it's structured to be a 90 day program. So within that 90 days, um, you will have uh, purchased your birds, built out and established all your infrastructure, raised your birds, harvested them, marketed them, and sold them within that 90-day time frame. So you officially be a successful pasture poultry farmer within 90 days. Um, of course, you do get lifetime access to the course. So if you like, you can go as slow or as fast as you want to. It's, it's self-paced, okay. um, but I give you like a 90-day itinerary. Like this is what you need to do each day to kind of stay on track. So. Okay, that's, that's, that's really helpful for people that are intimidated with the process. Mm -hmm. yeah, we're, we're going through the stubborn bumps and bruises yeah. ourselves. We, uh, yeah. uh, through the APA uh, convention, we got hooked up with uh, Barn to Door and we're slowly yeah. building up our, our website and our things to start pushing out our stuff. We're, we're building up our, well, I guess because we kind of come from like a gardening thing. Uh, from the side, we kind of have a marketing, um, but we just, we're now like, we're like, okay, we actually have products. So yeah. like, we need to, yeah. yeah. We've already got a little bit of customer base too there with the garden, right? That you can easily yeah. transition over to, hey, you want, you're buying your cucumbers. How about a chicken too, you know? Yeah. Well, see, the, the, the funny thing is the garden was basically just for us and we'll share extra to our family friends, but now this with this whole uh this whole convention and stuff now we're thinking you know like and, okay. and we had a high tunnel now so now we can be like hey you know this yeah we haven't started growing in our high tunnel just yet we're preparing it um but that is going to be we we are gonna we're off of the main road so we do plan on having even a, a farm, farm stand, stand yeah. here yeah um and people come and buy products from us so um It'll be kind of nice to build on that mm -hmm. as time goes on. Gracefield Homestead said they have six acres and still here to learn all that they can and be, bring my dreams to reality. I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, thanks. Oh, that's great. So we're, we're not too much um, bigger. We're only six and a half acres ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Ernest Roots wants to know how many birds you need to produce six figures? <laughs> One million birds. <laughs> 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 that's a that's a great question, Ernest Farm. So, um, you know, and one thing that I I try to stress to folks is um, it's interesting. You know, so like we met at the APA conference, the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association, which is a great resource, a lot of great information there. Um, oh yeah, oh, so inspiring to go to the meeting. It changed our minds. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it feels like when I go there, I'm like, all right, you, you kind of get stuck in the farming world and like doing your day to day stuff. And then you go to a meeting like this, you're like, oh, there's other people that are weird like me. And they're like, hey, <laughs> and then I'm you not the only thinking. one, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. It's good to network and see those other people. But, um, but yeah, it's been interesting because when I go to these conferences, you know, over the past few years, it's, it's kind of like people, people kind of, I, I don't know if maybe tell me if you guys experience this, but it's kind of like people ask you like how many birds you raise or how many, you know, and then they kind of wear it as a badge of honor. Like, Oh, I do 5,000 a year. I do 10,000, I do 20,000 a year. You know, this kind of thing. Right. Um, and I've kind of noticed that, but to me, um, I've, I've kind of taken the opposite approach and I want to see, okay, how little can I do 
how few birds can I raise on smaller acreage and still be very successful doing that? Because it's amazing when you see a lot of these farmers that are doing, you know, in the multiple thousands, you know, million dollars of revenue, but their profit margins, you know, 5%. And it's just yeah. it's crazy. And it's like, man, when the margin that tight, what happens when your fee cost goes up 10%? What happens when your processor charges you an extra dollar per bird? That just blows your whole margin. You're, you're toast at that point. Um, so a lot of farmers have the wrong mindset and think, if I do more volume, I'll be more profitable. I'll make more money. I'll be more successful. But when you do more volume, when you raise more birds or you grow more crops or raise more sheep, whatever it is, um, that's more infrastructure. That's more time. That's more labor. That's a bigger freezer. I mean, that more people you got to hire, your expenses go up. So you actually end up making less money the bigger you get, uh, you know, less profit margin. And so because your expenses grow. Um, so, you know, I try to tell folks it's not about volume. It's not about numbers, it's about margin. So if you can have a good profit margin, you can be very successful. So, uh, you know, so to give you an idea, so we can, we can, we net about $30,000 per acre is what we kind of look at net profit per year. And the way we do wow. that is doing 500 birds per acre and we can do multiple cycles. Um, we have a very sandy soil here. So we can run three to four batches of birds per acre because that, you know, all that nitrogen stuff leaches out pretty quickly. We get a lot of rain. Um, you may not be able to do that in some areas, but, um, but my folks, we run about a 50% profit margin uh, on average wow. after all expenses are paid, which is pretty rare uh, for poultry. But, wow. um, but that's the key is if you can get a larger margin, you can, the more you can cut your costs and increase your, your sales price, you know, the more successful you're going to be and the less birds you can produce. So um, like so to give you a quick example. So if we, when I was selling to restaurants, I would sell a whole duck. And I was selling them for around $30, $35 for a whole bird. And after all expenses, I would net about $10 a bird. I put about $10 in my pocket at the end of the day. Uh, but once we shift to do direct consumer, um, well, first thing we found not a lot of people buy a whole duck. That's like, yeah, here is that. Uh, so we figured out we, we got to do some different things. We got to do it kind of different strategy here. And so we started doing more cuts, more value added products, uh, this sort of thing. And so we could, we could, in uh, increase our product options, like our, uh, what we're selling. Uh, more people were comfortable with buying these different product options and we could sell them for more money. And so we went from netting $10 a bird, selling a whole bird to a chef to netting $70 a bird. Yes. Seven zero dollars a bird net, uh, selling direct to consumer. Cause we did a bunch of value added products and that we could increase our sales price and, you know, do a bunch of extra parts. So, what are value-added products? What are these extra parts you're talking about? So a great example would be, there's a lot of parts that we don't utilize. The head, the feet, the bones, the livers, the gizzards, the hearts, all that stuff. If you can find a clever way to util utilize that, that stuff would normally get thrown away. Uh, so if you can make something out of that and sell it, then you can, that's just ice cream. You know, that's just, that's just icing on the cake um, because you weren't planning on that. Um, so, yeah, so a lot of those extra parts we can utilize and, and, and sell as well. So My understanding is like uh, dog food and dog treats. Uh, what are yeah. some of the ways that you've seen those parts be used um, that is common that you've seen? Yeah, 100%. So like um, like the feet, the heads will sell as dog treats. Uh, the bones and stuff like that, like the, the frames after we part them out, like what's left, um, we'll, we'll make like bone broth out of that. Um, so there's so many things you can do, you know, you can, you know, you can make chicken salad, you can make smoked chicken and you know, there's so many things. And, and the further along that, the, the, the value ladder, you can make that the more ready to eat, the more easily accessible, um, it is for the consumer, the more you can charge for it. Yeah. Um, hmm. Wow. Yeah. That, uh, that's one thing I, I, at the APA convention that it, it blew my mind where, uh, people were having trouble getting rid of the drums, the wings and stuff. I'm like, really? That's like one of the best parts of, uh, in, the, in the thighs. And like people were having a hard time uh, getting rid of I, I'm just hearing a the lot of this. He, yeah, he in the thighs. Him. I was like, that's the best part. But like, right. the, breast, <laughs> the breast and the... We uh, were like, that's dry. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm the same way, but I guess some people are just 
Yeah. yeah, I mean, they just like certain parts, and I don't know, but yeah, and then just learning that you could get more money from doing the cut ups and stuff. So that way, I was mm-hmm. like, all right, we're going, you know, getting to find a USDA processor to do all of this stuff and start. Yeah, we're about to learn our lesson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, the great thing about cut ups is like compared to whole birds, not only um, did we find more customers, like more people were willing to buy a pack of breast or a pack of thighs because that's what they're used to buying in the grocery store. Uh, so not only did we get more sales, but we could sell it at a higher price because it was a cut up too. Yeah. So we made more profit and we're selling more. Our top line was more too. So it was just, yeah, it made total sense to do the cut ups. And a lot of that comes from people being so programmed about, you know, the, what's commercially available is what mm-hmm. I've seen. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Emma, I'm a, I'm a thigh, quarters, drumstick myself, and the wings, breast. I, I but mean, you know what, Emma? We learned that people don't make as much money off of those. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. The, uh, uh, the Ernest Bruce said, Apple is the best group we've been part of. People make it what it is. How, how long have you been part of Now, you're also an editor, I, I believe, for Apple, the newsletter. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, I've contributed a few articles um, okay. to the to the Apple magazine, you know, contributing editor as well. So, yeah, sometimes if I come across something that's interesting or, or you know, worthwhile to share, I'll share it. Um, um, but yeah, I've been a member, I guess, for five years. And yeah, it's a great organization. Fantastic. Lots of, lots of knowledge there. No, How long have I been? No, a lot longer than that. I'm trying to remember how long. Uh, Joel started this uh, group, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. He was one of the founding members. I mean, it's, I don't know, 15, 20 years, maybe. I don't know. Oh, okay. Exactly. I was thinking 12, 15 years. Yeah. <laughs> they have said, yep, give me all that. That's what I'm saying. See, That's I don't the understand these people. <laughs> That's where the flavor is. <laughs> it must have sounded like gentrification of chicken meat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a, uh, it was said, this is super helpful with us looking into expanding our sales of meat birds. We've been raising them. Uh, yeah, we've been in their ear about the PAPA conference since we were there. Yeah. And yeah. see, and the thing that you were just talking about, trying to get your overhead uh, cost down, and we're part of this uh, co-op Facebook group, and a lot of people are like, oh, man, I'm going to try to get these birds as big, these corner crops as big. I'm like, why? Why would you spend all that feed on that? I'm like, my goal four and a half pounds as possible. If it gets to six weeks, I'm done. They're going to the processor, bam, wham. I'm trying to find that margin. What I have to, the what lowest is, yeah. amount of feed I can spend them to get to that four and a half pounds as quick as possible. Does they keep that overhead cut? Yeah, cut. we're we're yeah. in the lesson of that. Have you have you discovered a sweet spot for you? Um well like for example like with our ducks um processing is by far our biggest cost yeah um so y- y- i would say look you got to look at your personal situation like if you guys are processing on farm yourself your processing is probably not very high your fee cost is probably higher than your processing yeah. i have the opposite effect my processing is way higher than my fee cost so if i feed them a little bit more it's worth it to get a larger bird because i'm paying so much to get them butchered uh yeah. so yeah it, it depends on your situation like you got to look at your cost, evaluate like, okay, where do, where can I trim, you know, where can I cut my cost uh, to make a, you know, a bigger impact? Um, yeah. Cause you're, you got the expense of driving 12 hours mm-hmm. and then uh, do you have to, well, you're, you're doing, you said 400 birds at one time to send to the processor. Yeah. We do about 400 at a time. Yeah. And what's 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 a good window uh, to process uh, ducks so that way you don't get their dow feathers? We learned about that at the Apple convention. Yeah. So um, with ducks, um, it's very crucial to process them when they're during when it's during their molt, um, and because any time outside of that period, you're going to get feathers that don't come out, you're, or you're going to get immature what they call pin feathers that are sticking in the skin that you can't get out that don't look good. It's not very presentable. You also don't want to be biting into something that, you know, got little feathers in it. Um, Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can pick your teeth with it, but I don't want to do that. So, um, so the optimal window when that molt is, is generally seven weeks, seven, you can push them as long as eight weeks. You don't really want to go after eight weeks of age. Um, 
And so that's a general window. The weather can affect that. Um, if it's hotter, you can push them a little bit longer. If it's colder, you can. it's usually a little bit earlier. Uh, but in general, it's that seven to eight week period, usually for ducks. And that gets tricky, though, because with butchers, you have to, you have to, you, you have, have to time you it. have to schedule yeah. out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it does. Um, yeah, because if your butcher doesn't have an appointment, then you're like, oh, crap, you know, and so. That's kind of why I uh, part of the reason why I came up with like the itinerary, right? And and the program is like, okay, you need to make sure like you order your chicks, and the day you order your chicks, and you know they're coming in on this day, you need to make your processing appointment so that you yeah. don't stuck, right, and you can't process your birds. Um, now with the Peking ducks, are are they a self sustainable or do you have to always get those from a ha only hatcheries can produce those? No, they um they can breed on their own. So it's kind of okay. cool. So unlike the Cornish cross. So I um yeah, we actually bred our own birds on farm for a very long time. Um and that was more out of necessity because the premier hatchery was on the west coast in California that I was getting all my birds from and I was having problems getting birds when it was either really cold or really hot, and a lot of them were dying on arrival. It was taking two, three days to get here. And there's a lot of other producers on the East Coast that I knew um, that were having the same issues. And so I was like, well, heck, I'll just, you know, keep some and and raise them. And so we kept a laying flock, about 250 birds um, males and females. And so we would collect the eggs and fertilize eggs every day. And then we incubate those about a big, large, you know, huge commercial scale incubator. And we're incubating all of our own birds. And, um, and then I actually produced or supplied some producers on the East Coast for a little while. Um, now you don't we don't see that issue as much. There's a lot more hatcheries that are that are supplying ducks, um, you know, all over the place. Um, so it's not as much of an issue anymore. But uh, for a long time, I was raising all my own birds. I don't recommend that. <laughs> uh, that's a whole other thing to learn. Like, okay, the incubating process and and how to get we're good in it. We're doing it. Yeah. 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 Oh, you are. Okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah we um, just we we got the, that uh, hatching time 180. And yeah. we just, uh, but we, for this batch, we just did a small test batch just to see our fertility rate. Yeah, we're really just using it for fertility rates. Yeah. And um, our other thing that we do is that people buy hatching eggs from us. So. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. So how are your rates looking? Are they pretty good? Yeah. Um, let me see. I'm, I'm, I'm a number guy. It's like Excel. I have Excel spreadsheet. spreadsheets for everything to keep track of. Even how all many my... eggs I'm, kept, I'm collecting a day for each breed that we're calculating. Because for us, it's homework. We're sitting here trying to figure yeah. out, you know, where, where, what do we need to cut? What's working for us? What's not working for us? Um, what was the hatchery? Yeah, so for the, yeah, for the geese was 86, uh, fertility, a great fertility hatch rate. And for the American breast, it was 86 points. Yeah. For the American breast is good. The Welsh Harlequin wasn't too it good. Was it was about 70, yeah, about 71%. Yeah. But I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of nice to go and look at that for us. Yeah, it is. Yeah. That's fantastic. I mean, that's not bad at all. Yeah, um, it, I mean, we like that about things. Like, we like to experiment and just kind of like measure it and try to look at things in a measured way. Mm -hmm. And I was gonna say, like, with with um, with hatching, you know, like, yeah, I mean, that's a great thing to do as a, on a small scale. It's also another revenue stream, right? You you can sell the hatching eggs, you can sell day old chicks. Um, yeah. But the reason I say I don't recommend it if you're doing it on a commercial scale is because usually most people are doing all in, all out. So if you're getting a large batch of birds, a couple hundred birds, you know, you 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 want to raise everything at once and then everything harvested at the same time. Because if you're if you're trying to, you know, hatch out 10 birds and then next week another 20 birds and then three weeks later another 50 birds, like it makes you know, it's a logistical nightmare. And then you're then you're processing every other week, then you got multiple shelters and i mean it, it's just it, it it's, it's just so much more efficient from a time production standpoint if you do all in all out um, yeah. So. yeah i want to address a question about why don't people let the moms keep the eggs until they hatch and and i'll give my answer um 
they're terrible at that job. <laughs> if I had to rely on the hens to hatch out and have a quantity of birds, they might be successful with just a number, but they're really like, I, I have a lot more success incubating eggs. Like I'll have a lot more babies incubating. Yeah. Um, but that, that's my answer to that. Uh, do you have any feedback about that or experience with na natural birdie, moms? Birdie hens. Um, yeah, I mean, I would agree with what you said. And, and, um, also, you know, we, we, we're usually doing, you know, large volume groups for meat production. So, you know, again, if we had moms sit on the eggs, we'd be getting hatches all over the place and <laughs> that's got to be processed that seven, eight weeks. We can't, we can't yeah. process all these random times. It would never work, especially for ducks. Um, chickens, you might be able to get away with it. You got a little more leeway or turkeys there, but, um, yeah, yeah. we're trying to do stuff in a in a in a con controlled environment. It mm -hmm. doesn't work very well. Yeah. Ernest said, "Is there a higher profit margin on ducks compared to chickens?" Uh, yes and no. Um, uh, it's you know, so with ducks, your your the cost of your duckling is going to be more than a chick. You know, you can buy Cornish cross for a dollar, dollar fifty, whereas ducks are probably going to run you you know five dollars, four or five dollars. The feed's the same. The process is the same. Process the processing uh, portion is a little bit more difficult and a little more expensive, um, but you you can usually sell them for a little bit more. So, but you can also increase your profit margin on chickens if you just kind of think outside the box, think about some of those value added products and, and utilizing those extra parts of the chicken as well. Yeah, like the bone broth and also. Yep. The, uh, yeah. yeah, we have chicken feet that I dehydrate uh, for dog snacks and stuff like that. Yeah, we're venturing off into into that as well, just to try it out. After what going through the Apple conference, we were like, "Oh wow!" And, and then we saw that how much they're charging in in the pet store. We're like, "Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh like, yeah." Yeah, we're, we, we come from the, the mindset of waste not, want not. Like, I don't want to waste if there's a use for it, you know? A hundred percent. I like to try to use every part of it, you know, kind of like the Indians did, you know, like use every every part you can of the animal, you know? And um, and so I'll tell you a great story. I was, I was um, you know, selling our birds at the markets and we couldn't sell the wings. Uh, I was getting this backlog of wings. Nobody really wanted the wings. Maybe they're too expensive. You know, they weren't, there's not a lot of, meat on a duck wing um but what happened was i i started um selling them as dog treats and i increased the price three it, i was selling for three times as much money as dog food than people would pay for them as people food and people and they were flying off the shelves i was like this is crazy you know <laughs> like so, yeah, they're three dogs. Times their dogs and will for themselves it was just like this is nuts you know I was like, I was like, maybe I should just sell all my stuff as dog food. <laughs> Make more money. Yeah. <laughs> the way people are about their dogs. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Jeff, how how can people find you uh, and reach out to you? Yeah. Are you on any um, social media platforms and whatnot? Sure. Yeah. Instagram, uh, Farmer Jeff Sawicki. Same thing on YouTube. Uh, have a YouTube channel with some you know great videos on there about you know stuff we do. Um, Farmer Jeff Sawicki as well. I just uh, uh, watched the uh, the the duck watering system. That oh you yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I was um, I was excited about that because um, that was something that I I spent a lot of nights sitting up at four two o'clock in the morning and couldn't sleep and I was like thinking like how am I going to water these things you know like you know you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like thinking about stuff and it's not um, messy, so, so to find some kind of <laughs> solution. Yeah, and and, and so okay. like. With ducks, you know, they, they don't need a lot of, a lot. so one misconception is they don't really need water. They like it and it encourages breeding, uh, but they don't need water. In fact, if you, if you have a handful of ducks, you know, that's, that's fine. You can put some kiddie pools out and that they're happy with that. But when you start getting the larger numbers of kiddie pool or small pond, they're just going to foul so quickly. They're going to poop in it, do everything else, track, you know, poop that's on their feet is going to get in there. Then they're going to drink it. And that's not a good situation. Um, so I had to figure out a way to give them water that they couldn't poop in. Uh, and for ducks, it's key that they can kind of rinse their nostrils and their eyes. 
and they can kind of dump their bills in the water. So they do need you know, a decent amount of water. Um, and so what I came up with was that water you saw um, basically is a four inch PVC pipe that I cut the top off of to make a trough that fills with water. So I get two to three inches of water in there so they can dump their bills, rinse their eyes, but they can't poop in it. And, and that's worked great. Um, uh, and so that, and that was really cool. Yeah. I, I like that. One yeah. of the things I do is with a five gallon bucket, um, I'll do four holes around it so that mm -hmm. they can put their head in there and drink, yeah. but they can't get in it or anything like that. Yep. It's something that's worked for me, mm -hmm. um, but I like seeing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think it's been over an hour, so I don't want to keep your time. Yeah. <laughs> Did you have anything else that you want to cover before we want to wrap up? Um, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I mean, if anybody has any questions about anything, you know, I, I'm, I'm always happy to like share information. So feel free to, to email me. Like if you go to my website, regenerativesuccess.com, you know, you have links on there. You can email me. There's a, the duck breed report, you know, a lot of free information on my YouTube and the website. So yeah, check those out. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm happy to share information. Do so. you have any um, other conferences coming up that you might be speaking at or or that you're just going to be going to for educational purposes? Uh, nothing that I'm doing um, anytime soon. Um, there's some stuff coming up like in the fall and winter. That's usually when a lot of the conferences are because I guess, you know, production well, kind yeah. of slows down. Yeah. Um, yeah. But nothing coming up, yeah, in the spring or summer. Okay. okay. Well, I appreciate you joining us. This was yeah. really helpful, I think, for our audience, some of the questions sure. they've had. Yeah, I'd like to thank Emma for being our our, our little moderator out here, putting all yeah. your, your links in and whatnot. Thank y'all for uh, being um, engaging, asking questions, help things of that nature. And yeah, and check out Sunny's place because on Instagram, her stories with her ducks are really, really cute. Yeah, she raises so, Swedish uh, yeah, ducks. Yeah, they're really cute. I like oh, yeah, to check that out. Awesome. No, yeah, no thank you guys for putting this all together. No problem. Thank you for uh, uh, spending some time and uh, talk with us and our, our viewers and, and whatnot. And if we don't see you at... Uh, We're going to see you at another APAPA conference. Yeah, we'll definitely be there. Be there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's become our important one. Yeah, that one so far has been the best uh, best conference. And more we, we've been to lots of homes and yeah. conferences and stuff. That was the best. I yeah. agree. It's not it's not only informational because people just willingly share any information. It's it's so much information that you're like trying to wrap your head all around. And I'm like taking notes to go back, like, oh yeah, I got a good look at this, check into that. Like it's literally but, a trade secret. Yeah, face. like people are freely sharing how they're it's a fire hose. Like, yeah. you're like, oh my gosh, to the mouth, yeah. you're putting all this information in. Uh, but it's also a great networking thing, right? To meet all these people and, and talk to them. They're doing a similar thing as you, which is, which is, and it's just, for me, it's very inspirational because you kind of, like I said, you kind of get in that rut, right? I'm sure you guys experience that. You kind of get in that same routine every day on the farm and then you meet other people and then you kind of get some new ideas and you get excited. And, all jazzed. Uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah a good time. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's definitely, definitely a thing. Well, <clears throat> like I said, we normally do this every first Saturday of each month, but we're actually going to be doing another uh, for those that are watching and uh, now and on the replays, we're going to be doing a, another uh, live next Saturday, same back time, same back channel with Pork Ryan. If people don't know about Pork Ryan, he is the, the uh, what do you call pig evangelist? Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah he's he, a, he speaks at different conferences. Yeah, stuff. he is a kind of work, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. He, I, I love hearing him talk and, and everything. It's it's a good, good thing, but he's not going to be talking about pigs, he's going to be talking about uh, conferences. What, what, what it's like to be a speaker at conferences, <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> Yeah. So we'll be uh, doing, uh, talking with him next Saturday at at seven. So hope to see everybody there again. And uh, until next time, let's grow together. All right. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night.